Hello, everyone, for joining. Um, we will uh, start the webinar in just a couple of minutes. Thank you. Hello, and good morning, afternoon, and evening, and thank you for joining the latest in the webinar series hosted by Cardinal Commerce. I'm Paul Harrison, Head of Sales Enablement and Business Development here at Cardinal, and I'm delighted that so many of you could join us today from all parts of the globe. Uh, now, before we do get started, on behalf of Cardinal and Visa, I would like to acknowledge the plight that for many COVID-19 has brought and we do hope everyone and their families is keeping safe. Interestingly, with a surge in online shopping in the past couple of months, there's also been a sharp increase in online fraud. So designed to keep online shoppers safe, the importance of PSD2 or the Second Payment Service Directive and SEA, which stands for Strong Customer Authentication, cannot be overemphasized. Now, as the deadline associated with PSD2 approaches, there's no doubt there is more and more of a flurry of mixed information circulating throughout the ecosystem, purporting as advice to merchants. This, in turn, leads to anxiety and potential confusion among the merchant population. At Cardinal, we felt it would be helpful, indeed necessary, to do a fact check and set the record straight. So to that end, today's webinar topic, entitled Debunking the Myth of PSD2, addresses just that. In other words, we're going to first call out those common misconceptions as they pertain to SCA and PSD2, and then we will confirm the actual truth. That way, merchants can feel more secure in the knowledge that they're dealing with real information about authentication. Now, I'm very excited that joining me today are two colleagues from Visa, an industry authority itself. And they are Caroline Birchnall, Head of Authentication, and Caroline, Caroline Grole, Head of SCA Optimization, both at Visa Europe. So today we are coming to you from our homes in different parts of the world. Uh, Caroline and Caroline, uh, you're both very welcome. Hi. Um, and and it's, it's good to be with you. Um, uh, now, I have to admit, I am relieved that you both pronounce your names differently, uh, or else I fear I would have caused much confusion and <laughs> embarrassment for myself. Um, but perhaps you'd like to uh, introduce yourselves and describe a bit uh, uh, what you actually do within Visa. So, oh, Caroline, sure. should, I, should I start? Yeah, um, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Can, um, 
Yeah, so uh, my name is Caroline Birchnell, and as Paul said, I'm responsible for authentication in Europe. Now, this is quite a challenging role at the moment because there's just so much happening, and authentication and SEA covers such a wide spectrum of activity, and clearly with e-com, as Paul said, being really, really important at the moment and getting it right, uh, and the fact that we're seeing fraud uh, you know, emerge a little bit during the current conditions, it really highlights the importance of, of all of this. But really what's driving it for all of us is the regulation, and that's a lot of which we're going to talk to you about today. So it's really brilliant to be here, and thank you to the Cardinal team for inviting me. So I'm really looking forward to helping talk about debunking some of the myths around uh, PSD2 SCA. Thank you, Paul. Over to you, Caroline. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Okay, hi. Um, so, yes, I'm Caroline Drollet, uh, also in the authentication team, but more looking at SCA optimization. So I do pronounce my my name Caroline, and I don't have the British accent because even though I work in the London team, I am actually French Canadian. So that's the accent you're you're gonna hear. Um, and basically, I'm in the authentication team uh, headed by Caroline, but basically I'm the one that tries to avoid authentication at all costs. That's why I'm, uh, the title is uh, how you optimize SCA. So I cover all the ways that you um, can do to avoid having to go to a step up or a challenge and do SCA. And I also look at every use cases from a merchant perspective. What happens in those use cases? Do you need to do SCA? If you do, then okay, but maybe you don't, and how you flag all your transactions. So that's the role I play in the team. Okay, wonderful, and thank you for that. So, uh, so that's great news. Clearly, we've got on the call today um, really the authorities on authentication and SCA within Visa. Um, so, just as a side note for our audience, uh, there is a Q&A box on your screen where you can post any questions you might have, and um, we'll certainly leave time at the end uh, of the session to address as many of those as possible. And please do also note that um, you'll receive a recording of this webinar. And uh, last thing is, in the content box on your screen, there's um, also a link to previously hosted Cardinal webinars. Uh, so I think we are started. Uh, so, so let's get going. Um, so, Caroline, um, there is a myth that we have come across in the marketplace. Uh, uh, where merchants should avoid 3D Secure at all costs, even when they need to comply with PSD2 uh, SCA. Um, what is the truth? Well, the truth is merchants must be able to support SCA because in the end it's always the issuer that has the final say on whether SCA is needed or not, so you need to be ready to support it. But having said that, there is a lot of things a merchant can do to minimize the chance of facing a challenge and to minimize friction. So I'll try to cover a few of those. So the first thing a merchant can do to minimize friction is to use pre-dispute tools to minimize fraud. Uh, and uh, why is that? Because uh, when you minimize fraud, you maximize your ability to use exemption. So exemption can only be used when transactions are low risk and, and when an acquirer is within a certain fraud threshold. Um, so it's important to keep that low. And basically, when a dispute is raised, it's often marked as fraud even when they were raised simply because a customer did not recognize the transaction in question. Our visa statistics indicate that um, that uh, in 90% of the time a dispute is, is raised, it is actually marked as fraud. Uh, but only 34% of the time it's actually um, uh, a friendly fraud. So it has nothing to do with it. So if merchants start using the uh, pre-dispute tool, it helps to give more information to issuers about the transaction so that when a, a customer calls in to dispute, more information can be given and the, the, the cardholder can have that ha ah, moment. Oh, yes, okay, I bought that. Never mind, I won't dispute it. So that 
enables to avoid inflating fraud rates. And that's key because it maximizes the chances to use exemption. So uh, from the acquiring side, if the acquirer has lower fraud, they can uh, use more exemption and support merchants in doing so. And uh, as well, if the merchant has less fraud disputes, their risk score will be better. So it's more chances that when the issuer receives the transaction, they won't challenge it and agree to provide the exemption. So that's the first thing. The second thing a merchant can do to uh, avoid SCA or minimize friction is to properly flag all of their transactions so that if they are out of scope, issuers can recognize them and do not ask for SCA. So to give you the scale of this, we estimate that Visa that 46% of all card not present transactions are actually out of scope and won't need any SCA. Of course, that will vary a lot depending on the merchant business. Maybe and for one merchant, everything is in scope. But just by giving you the ecosystem statistics, it, it shows that how important that is and how much of an opportunity there is uh, to avoid uh, any challenge. On that note, I'll mention quickly that 24% uh, estimated transaction or merchant initiated transaction and out of scope. And uh, these transactions are very specific and must be flagged in a particular way. So very important to do so. And then out of scope, no SCA uh, needed. So finally, the third thing uh, that um, a merchant can do to to uh, to minimize friction is to make sure uh, they use risk scoring tool, and um, because if the the transaction uh, that are low risk enable to optimize the customer experience, well, what how you will handle those transactions can be optimized. So um, uh, these strategies will enable to, to know which exemption, for example, are likely to be accepted straight into authorization or have to go to 3DS. Uh, and whether a challenge could be asked or not. So um, uh, risk scoring is very helpful to optimize the customer experience. But uh, having said all of that, so I did say in the introduction, I'm the, the, the expert at trying to avoid doing SCA. So having said that, the ultimate decision is with the issuer. They can always decide to challenge a transaction, and therefore the merchant must be ready to use 3DS. And there's a lot of benefits in doing so. Of course, when 3DS is used, there is liability protection provided. And uh, I'd remind that even when 3DS is used, the issuer can always decide to apply an exemption themselves. And therefore, using 3DS doesn't mean there will be a step up. So that's what I have to say about that first thing. Okay, well, thank you uh, very much, Caroline, uh, for debunking that first uh, myth. Um, so the second one, 3D Secure is a conversion killer and will negatively impact authorization rates. This is certainly something that we've heard at uh, uh, Cardinal Commons. But perhaps, Caroline, uh, you might be able to uh, shed some light on that myth. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, oh, wow. We're having a real downer on 3DS at the moment, aren't we? Conversion <laughs> killer. Um, that's, that's a pretty strong, that's a pretty strong criticism. Um, so I really want to kind of put everybody right on this one because interestingly, I guess within Europe, we have been using 3D Secure for many, many years. It's extremely well used and, and works pretty well in, in many markets in Europe. So really and truly, at the moment, so regions with government mandates, such as Europe, so we're talking particularly about PSD2 today, but clearly there are other regions and other countries around the world with, with regulation and probably are likely to be many more actually in the future. But certainly in Europe, 3DS is actually a conversion optimizer and actually can help increase authorization rates quite, quite the opposite opposite of, of what you're describing there. Um, and what I just want to kind of explain what I, what I mean by that. 
So first of all, you know, when it comes to authorization approvals, this is the, really what most merchants are interested in. Most merchants just want to complete a sale. And what we see with 3D secure, secure transactions, so fully authenticated transactions typically in Europe have authorization approval rates of around about 95% versus non-authenticated approvals, which are around about 90% on average. Of course, it varies a lot uh, between different merchants, particularly if you're goods uh, you're selling tend to be more higher risk. Um, it varies a little bit from country to country, but on average, the trend is always the same, that we see much, much higher approval rates with fully authenticated transactions. Um, so and there's really good reasons for that, obviously. Caroline, sorry to interrupt. I mean, it's five percentage point difference. I mean, that's, that's uh, not insignificant. I'm <laughs> sure it isn't. Absolutely. And it's something that not everybody knows, to be honest. So it, it really pays to know that. It, it makes a big difference. Um, and when you couple that with the fact, as Caroline said, that you're getting liability protection as well, um, then really it does, it does really make a big difference. What we're seeing in Europe is that really we have very high adoption rates amongst the merchant community. So 3DS of one version or another um, is pretty close to 90%. And we expect as once the regulation takes effect that that really will move to 100% because all merchants will absolutely need it. It will be a regulatory necessity. And without some version of 3D Secure, you will not be able to do business in Europe very easily at all. Um, it's really important to know that. Um, as Caroline said, many issuers have implemented risk-based authentication, so they are making risk decisions based on um, 3D secure data. And that's great because it means that they just don't need to challenge every time. Now, Karen is going to talk a bit about the exemption, so I'll let her expand upon that a little bit more. Uh, but still, it's good to know. And we have a rule in Europe that means that all issuers must have implemented risk-based authentication technology. So we're, we're pretty strict on that, and we really see everybody moving in that direction now, which is very encouraging. With the new version of EMV3 to in V3D Secure, which we'll talk about soon, we're actually seeing really good adoption rates of that as well amongst issuers. And currently we have around about 85% of total PV, which is eligible to go through the new version of EMV3D Secure. So if any of you are not using that yet or you've implemented but don't feel that you want to turn it on, please reconsider because you will be very pleasantly surprised and you'll start to see issuers are actually doing a pretty good job of that now. So, yeah, I hope that's kind of busted myth, myth number two, Paul. Uh, absolutely. And uh, I suppose even just to add a little bit more to that, you know, what uh, you cite uh, um, on behalf of Visa, we also hear uh, similar sort of um, uh, numbers from, from other card schemes, uh, especially as it pertains to Europe, uh, that, you know, 3DS helps uh, improve the authorization approval rate. So, wonderful. So, two down. Uh, now, we're, we're on to the third w one here, um, and Caroline, uh, the myth it goes that a fraud tool is all you need to satisfy FCA requirement. Um, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, so it's a bit, a bit as we said before, you know, a, a, obviously a fraud tool is massively important and Caroline's already mentioned that and, you know, having a layered approach to your risk management, you need everything you've got. So I don't want to for a second say that some form of, you know, really good risk assessment um, before you even get to the point of 3DS is massively important, of course, but to be compliant with um, PSD2 SEA, you will need um, 3D Secure. And the reason for that is, as Caroline said, sometimes a challenge will be needed. So if no exemption applies, there will be situations where a challenge has to take place and the issuer will need that to happen to be compliant. If they don't get that opportunity to uh, complete a challenge, they will have to decline the transaction. And in Europe, we have some really good soft decline codes, which enable them to send a decline back, um, which tells you that you need to uh, submit again with, with 3D Secure. Now, when an issuer completes a challenge, they're doing that increasingly in really, really 
good and, and low friction while you're living. Um, in fact, we're working really closely with issuers to try and drive the adoption of new technology. So, for example, behavioral biometrics is something that we're seeing more and more now, where issuers are sending an SMS code and running behavioral biometrics in the background. So there's very low friction involved in that. We have driven passwords pretty much out of the system, and we're hoping to get rid of them completely because everyone hates passwords. They're annoying. People forget them. They're easily hacked into by fraudsters. So there's every reason to get rid of them. Uh, and we're really working hard in Europe to, to see the back of passwords very quickly. Um, the other area that we're moving into is something called uh, out-of-band uh, authentication. And that enables, with the new version of 3D Secure, for issuers to use biometrics and Basically, there are three options that issuers have when they need to complete a challenge. They need to use two out of three options. One is something the customer has, so that typically would be a device. Um, secondly, something the customer knows, so we don't like passwords. So. Um, that would be something that we don't particularly like to use, such as um, knowledge-based questions, and we really steer issuers away from those. Uh, but thirdly, something that the customer is, so that would be behavioral biometrics or other forms of bi bi biometrics like Touch ID. So we're really moving in a good direction with that. Okay, so wonderful. That's it, Paul, and, that's uh, what I'm saying. Yeah, so, uh, and I think just picking up on what you said, just to stress that um, it, it's evolving so quickly and, and so the way that um, biometrics is, is really going to be at the forefront and make it a much more seamless uh, consumer friendly experience uh, compared to the old password uh, is I think worth stressing, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. And most issuers are really keen to integrate the whole authentication experience into their mobile banking. So they're using established methods that their customers are generally very, very familiar with. So it's really yeah, moving absolutely in that direction. Okay, well, wonderful. So thank you very much there, uh, Caroline. So we are three uh, down. Uh, now, uh, just to add a little bit of suspense, I'm not going to uh, advise um, how many myths we will cover. Um, but uh, myth number four in front of us, uh, merchants should try to use exemptions whenever possible. Um, Caroline, would you like to address that? Yes. Well, if the transaction is low risk, yes, use exemption as much as possible. I will, however, explain a few things about exemption. Whoever asks for the exemption takes the liability. So, as a merchant, is, are you ready to take the liability? If you are, ask for the exemption if it qualifies. Uh, and, but then uh, the word is, does it qualify? So not all transactions qualify uh, for an exemption. So for example, a high value transaction may not qualify. There are value thresholds. And then with those value thresholds, uh, it may uh, qualify for the exemption with one acquirer, but not with another. Because acquirers must themselves meet fraud thresholds to be entitled to use exemption. Uh, also, if an acquirer is entitled to use the exemption, they want to keep this right by keeping their fraud rate low. And therefore, they may decide that certain merchants that have a high fraud rate may not qualify to use any exemption because they don't want to jeopardize their ability to offer exemptions to other merchants. Uh, then a low value transaction may not always qualify uh, because there's uh, different cumulative thresholds that have to be met for the transaction to really be accepted with the low value exemption. And I'll talk a bit more about that um, a little bit later. And finally, for some exemptions, some criteria have to be met. So if I take the example of trusted beneficiary, some of the card networks have criteria that merchants need to meet to use them. Uh, and uh, even if they meet the criteria to use them, some issuers are not yet ready to uh, um, support that exemption, as it takes specific capabilities that must be first rolled out uh, at the issuer level as well. So 
Finally, it's always, uh, I think I mentioned that a little bit earlier, it's always the issue that has the final decision on an exemption. Uh, so uh, while we recommend you use them, you always have to be ready to do a 3DS in case. So what you need to do to use those exemptions is you must speak with your acquirer. They're the one who holds the key to you hold, uh, using those exemptions. They will tell you if you qualify, if they can support you, and they will tell you the circumstances in which uh, you can use an exemption or not and how. So, for example, and I, I thought there was a question earlier about that, exemptions can be used two different ways. You can ask an exemption via 3DS. Or you can, for some exemption, go directly to authorization. So your acquirer can tell you for which, uh, it, which road is best way to go in your circumstances. Maybe they'll say, in your case, I agree you use exemption, but only if you go to 3DS first because you're risky. So you need to discuss exemption usage as soon as possible with your acquirer. And they will explain to you other things such as, for example, the recurring transaction exemption is not needed, needed at all for some scheme. In the Visa scheme, recurring is it's an MIT, and therefore we require you flag it out of scope. There's no need to use the exemption. So uh, speak with your acquirer as soon as possible, but also keep in mind this business of exemption is all very new. I think at the beginning uh, it will be a bit slow going, maybe issuers will might be a little bit afraid to use it, but they are rolling it out and everybody in the ecosystem will gain experience with it. We hope it will show that fraud can be managed and kept low even when exemptions are used, when it's well done. And therefore, it's something that will evolve over time. Uh, at the beginning, you may get a few exemptions refused, but I, we would all hope and expect that as everybody gains uh, experience with those exemptions, more and more they will be uh, usable. Okay, and uh, I think um, you, as you said there, Caroline, it, it's going to evolve, and I think that's worth stressing, isn't it? it uh, the ecosystem is evolving, um, all the pieces are coming into place, and how exemptions will be handled uh, in the future, that process is going to evolve. And um, so I, I think uh, there's, there's good cause for, for optimism in that regard. Uh, so yeah. now on to the next myth. Um, we're four down. Uh, myth number five, um, and we've certainly heard this, uh, been said before, but it's not really true, is it, Caroline? An EMV 3D Secure Challenge is a bad thing. Well, this is the thing, and I'm not really agreeing with any of your mates so far on the call. Um, and basically, I think this is a really good one to, to raise, though, because, you know, that is often the case. I mean, merchants, I think, live in fear of a 3DS mm. challenge on the basis that you lose them a transaction, if anything goes wrong. It's, it's always a real potential pain point, to be fair. Um, so quite apart from what we're doing to um, really work hard with issuers to move towards things like bi bi biometrics, I think it's really important to remember that a challenge can actually save a transaction that could be very risky by allowing the customer to prove that they are who they say they are. So challenges normally when an issuer needs to complete a challenge are normally there for very good reasons. So it could be that they need to do a challenge because there's no exemption applies and from a regulatory perspective they basically have no option. Uh, that, that will be the case sometimes and then you just have to allow that to happen. Um, on the other hand, it could be that an issuer has recognised certain, certain aspects of a transaction despite the fact that you've done your risk assessment. They may see things that you have not seen or your risk system has not seen and they're challenging because that, gen that transaction is genuinely risky. Now, in that case, you're getting liability protection, and as we've seen, that's really worth it uh, and can genuinely make an impact on your fraud and on your authorization approval rates. And one of the things that Visa is doing to really make sure that this system works absolutely well as it should is to introduce a Visa performance program so we will be checking all sorts of different metrics. We'll be looking at approval rates, at abandonment rates, latency, um, availability, and all of these have metrics attached to them that issuers have to abide by. Um, 
And if issuers don't um, have good mm. performance, then there will be all sorts of penalties on our side that will apply. So we are really working very hard with the issuing community to make sure that they deliver the best possible level of service that, that they can. So I really think that any of you that are worried about this, um, I want to reassure you that that we are doing everything possible. And actually, what we're tending to see across the piece is that abandonment rates in Europe are at a maximum uh, of well below 5%. Now, 5% is our threshold for the performance program. Um, and we're already on the new version of EMV 3DS well below that. So I think things are moving in a very good direction. And generally, what we see are much lower friction uh, purchases and challenges when they do need to happen. So I do hope that reassures um, people, Paul. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, thanks for just killing that. Um, uh, it's certainly, uh, we at Cardinal can't agree more that a, a challenge is uh, not necessarily a bad thing at all. And that, indeed, it can actually be in the merchant's interest uh, because it's a way of catching those um, transactions, those fraudulent transactions that might otherwise get through. Uh, so thank you for uh, clarifying that. Um, Caroline, uh, delegated authentication is a good solution for FTA for all merchants. This is myth number six. Um, would you like to uh, well, comment on that? Yeah, so the delegated authentication is certainly a good solution. However, it can only be used by, by some merchants. And who is that? Merchants that can themselves perform two-factor authentication. Uh, so it requires a sophisticated means to authenticate already in place at the merchant level. So, so let me explain a bit more. So first, what is delegated authentication for those who may not be familiar? It's a concept uh, within the regulation that says that a payment service provider, in this case the issuer, can delegate the performing of SVA to a third party. But that's it. Is uh, delegating means it's the third party that must authenticate and they must have a way to do two-factor authentication among the two factors that Caroline uh, discussed uh, earlier, knowledge, possession, or inheritance. So uh, we don't expect that very many merchants at the moment are in a position uh, to do so. But uh, a few uh, may be eligible. In order to use that concept, so uh, for example, in the case of Visa, we run a program. So if you think, uh, you know, an issuer can delegate authentication to a merchant, uh, doing bilateral agreement becomes very, very long and tricky and, uh, you know, not, not uh, manageable. So um, uh, at Visa, for example, we run a program where it can be encompassing all the issuers that agree to it uh, so it's more easily uh, manage, but to enter the program, there are some criteria and fraud rates, and you must prove which authentication factors you'll be using and that it satisfies the regulation and all that. So a bit complicated. Uh, a word to say, in order to benefit from uh, this type of program, you must be uh, in the visa system on the MV 2.2, or sure. I believe MasterCard uh, enables it on 2.1 via some extension, but that's it. So there's a lot of little prerequisites uh, to follow. I think, so if I said many merchants cannot use it today, again, I would think this is something that will evolve over time. Issuers are a bit uncomfortable to delegate authentication. It's their responsibility to make sure everything will be okay and fraud managed with this new regulation. So they are a little bit nervous to delegate. So what we can see is they'll start delegating a little bit with a, a key big merchants, and when all will be demonstrated, it's fine. Uh, hopefully, you'll have all the solution providers that can enable smaller, smaller merchants to use those similar technologies and perform authentication so that the merchant can do it using its own ways without the friction added by the issuer. But I think so it will evolve in the next few years, will become more accessible, but we need to develop the trust in that delegated authentication before this happens. Okay, uh, thank you, Caroline. So <clears throat> that word evolve, uh, evolution uh, reappearing and certainly makes sense. Uh, so if I'm a small, medium-sized merchant today, 
uh, delegated authentication is probably not going to be uh, the priority in terms of uh, seeking exemptions. Uh, there, there could be, of course, other exemptions that uh, might be um, much more in my interest. Um, so yeah. thank you for, for killing uh, uh, myth number six. Um, so we're on to myth number seven. Um, merchants don't need to use authentication if all of their transactions are below 30 euros. Um, Caroline, would you like to uh, take that? Yeah, well, it's true that transaction on the 30 euros can benefit from the low value exemption. However, there's more to that, that exemption. Uh, there are thresholds. Uh, and the, the, the regulation says uh, every transaction on the 30 euros can uh, benefit from the exemption up to a maximum of five consecutive transactions for that card holder or a cumulative limit of all those transactions on the 30 euros of 100. Uh, and uh, the status of this threshold can only be known by the issuers not by the merchant. So even though uh, every transaction you may have might be five pounds, you never know when that particular transaction that the cardholder has used the, tie, the card four times before or for a total of 90 pounds, 95 pounds or 97 pounds already. So this transaction of five pounds you're doing may trigger the, the threshold and uh, SCA will be asked. So actually, we say from a merchant perspective, the low value exemption should be your last resort. Always use the TRA exemption first, uh, much more chance. So if it's low risk, uh, should go through. Uh, only use low value as a last resort. Okay. Well, uh, thanks for clarifying that, uh, Caroline. And uh, I suppose the, the devil's in the detail, isn't it? Because it's very easy to say uh, uh, all transactions under 30 euros um, are exempt, and uh, that's that's not the case. So merchants really do need to focus on the uh, the fine print. Um, so appreciate that. Um, that brings us to myth number eight: uh, merchants need to implement EMV 3DS version 2.2 .2 to satisfy the SCA uh, requirements. Um, Caroline, would uh, you like to address that? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Paul. Um, I mean, this is an interesting one, and there's a lot of debate around um, which version of, S of uh, EMV 3DS is the right one for everybody. So let's just kind of talk a little bit about that. I mean, the actual benefits of uh, EMV 3DS are, are really, really clear. There are a lot of advantages over the new version compared to the existing version of 3DS uh, 1.0. Um, 3DS 1 was invented a long time ago to really cater for uh, browser-based transactions, and clearly we've moved on a lot since then. Um, and really now um, the requirements are much more sophisticated with a lot of app-based purchases, different devices. Um, so it's really important to consider that when, con when thinking about which version of 3D Secure that is right for you. From a regulatory perspective, Visa's position has always been that all versions of 3D Secure can support the SCA requirements. So I want to be really clear about that and reassure anybody that, particularly if you're a small merchant with very simple and straightforward authentication needs, you perhaps aren't so in, in need of exemptions or, you know, it's going to be very straightforward for you, then I want to reassure you that 3DS version 1 will work. Um, but we really do advise where at all possible that everybody moves to the new version. Um, and there are some good reasons for that. Um, first of all, uh, clearly, as I mentioned before, it works across all devices. So if you've got app-based purchases, if you've got lots of consumers on smartphones, which pretty much everybody is now, um, or other devices, you will need DMV 3DS 2.2. Um, it is better for data sharing. So if you want to make sure that the issuer has the best opportunity to assess the risk of the transaction using data and remove the need for a challenge where at all possible, then EMV 3DS 2.2 is also really, really important. 
it enables the move to biometrics. So again, where that challenge needs to take place, it's very important that issuers are able to make that happen. And whilst they can configure ways around it with 3DS version 1, uh, that's really the exception. And they really mostly do need um, EMV 3DS uh, version 2 uh, to do that properly. One thing I would say, though, is that we do expect for many, many months to come, there, it is likely that some, despite the fact that we have very strict mandates and making really good progress with moving issuers on to the new version of 3D Secure, um, it's still likely that some small issuers in some markets, particularly in Southern and Eastern Europe and Central and Eastern Europe, they may still be on version one. Uh, but the vast majority, and as I say, we've already got 85% of issuer PV live on EMV 3DS, the vast majority we expect to move to the new version. So it's really important to focus on that. Um, and your partner, Cardinal, for example, will help you with that and help you uh, configure transactions uh, according to the right version. So back to you, Paul. Okay, thank, yeah, thank you, Caroline. A, a lot of um, very good, useful information, I think, for merchants uh, to know that, as you said, in the visa world, 85% of uh, volume uh, is already um, 3DS, EMV 3DS enabled. Um, and there's no doubt, uh, I think, the need for merchants to partner with a reliable, reputable uh, 3DS provider um, really makes sense because then they can work with the merchant to uh, to design the solution that makes suits their business best, and uh, and last but not least, as you said, um, 3DS 1.0. Um, although we've, as you cited earlier on, it uh, it certainly contributes to higher approval rates. Um, the, the new generation of 3D Secure is is going to be so much better uh, from a user experience point of view, as well as just transmitting so much more uh, data points through to the issuer. So it can only uh, really help have a, a, an even more positive impact on, on approval rates. Um, so thank you for really putting to bed myth number eight. Um, well, we're on to it. Myth number nine, issuers don't need to be on the latest version of 3D Secure. So. Um, uh, perhaps that's something, uh, Carol, Caroline, you you want to address. Same same sort of uh, topic, but really from uh, an issuer perspective, correct? Yeah, no, absolutely, Paul. And basically, as, as many people know, we've had our activation date in Europe has passed where we had a mandate that all issuers should be live on EMV 3DS 2.1. Um, that happened on the 14th of March. So as of that date, all merchants have the ability, should they wish to, to send transactions to EMV 3DS, regardless of whether the issuer is live or not. So that date has passed, and, and in theory, all, in, all issuers should be live. Um, clearly, um, in, re, in the real world, that doesn't always happen in the best possible way, as, as you would like it to. And clearly, in the current situation, there have been some issuers um, in some markets that have struggled to meet that deadline. But having said that, we, we've done pretty well uh, to get to 85% um, so far. Um, what you'll see here is we have a roadmap slide which shows you the key dates that are coming up on the issuer side. And this will give you some kind of expectation uh, around what, to, what, you, what you should see over the coming months. So uh, from March, that was our mandate date for having deployed EMV 3DS 2.1 in Europe. Um, pretty good progress with that. The next date coming up is that uh, we have a mandate for EMV 3DS 2.2. Um, now, 2.2, as we've described, is a, is a better version. It's, it's a better version for Europe. It enables application of some of the exemptions as well, which uh, you, you will need version 2.2 for that. For example, if you want to do visa trusted listing for trusted beneficiary exemption. Um, and we ex are expecting to get issuers live on that by September. By October, we expect that all acquirers should be able to ensure that all of their merchants have access to EMV 3DS 2.2 technology. Um, you may choose a different version. That's, that's entirely up to you. Uh, but we would encourage you otherwise, of course. But you must be uh, working with a vendor that does have that capability. Um, and then we actually, the reason for this is that all of our mandate dates have really been designed to get all issuers to the point 
where they are ready for SEA enforcement by the end of this year, which is currently the date that we have in Europe. 31st of December is the current European enforcement date for most of Europe. Um, and without issuers being live, clearly as merchants, you are not able to do what, what you need to do. So we focus very heavily on the issuing community here so that you're able to then uh, do what you need to do to be compliant. One, one quick word, I think, on, on regulation dates uh, that I will uh, just, just let you know because there have been some updates recently. That in the UK, um, we have recently had the FCA, which is the UK regulator, accepting the fact uh, that it's been very difficult for the ecosystem and that given the current COVID situation, everybody really needs more time to be able to test and implement the new technology. So they have agreed that the enforcement date for SCA in the UK will now be the 14th of September 2021. So that gives everybody six months longer than originally thought, and that's a really big relief to, to many of us. Uh, and Visa yeah. has worked very, very hard uh, with the ecosystem and the UK regulators in particular to get that delay agreed. So we're very pleased about that. Um, across the rest of Europe, we believe very strongly that there's a need for a delay across the rest of Europe as well. And we're also working very hard with the ecosystem, with the industry, uh, with payment, different industry groups, consumer groups, merchant groups, and with regulators directly themselves at European level and at national level to uh, lobby for a delay across the rest of Europe. We don't have any news to share on that right now, um, but we do hope very strongly that uh, European regulators will take a favourable view on that because it really is not the technological readiness that is the challenge here. It's all the complexity that Caroline has described around how, it, how you use the technology, how you use exemptions, and there really is a need for plenty of time to test all of this. So, so we've made a very strong bid for that um, and for extra time. So, yes, back to you on that one, Paul. Okay, well, thank you and, and for adding that hot off the press update uh, as it pertains to the UK. And let's see what uh, happens regarding the rest of Europe. Um, so, thank you. So, that brings us to, yes, I'm afraid it is, our final myth, uh, myth number 10. So, if I am a merchant, um, do I need to be sending... Uh, transactions down specific uh, 3DS rails, depending on what version the issuer is using. Uh, that's a myth that we have been hearing in the marketplace. Uh, and certainly in a merchant's mind, I could understand how that might uh, add some uh, complexity and uh, distress. Uh, Caroline, what have you got to say on that? Yeah, no, it's a really good question, isn't it, Paul? Because I think you're right. I mean, it's something that everybody does ask quite a lot. And I, and I think this is the key here, that if you have a really good qualified 3DS provider, they should be able to take that worry away from you and basically route transactions to the appropriate version of 3DS. Now, clearly, as we've explained, past the 14th of March activation day, in theory, anyone can send transactions to EMV 3DS. However, it's not always advisable. Generally speaking, we do advise everybody to route transactions to the version of 3DS that the issuer is on. And the reason for that is that because approval rates are so important, we tend to find that issuers are much happier um, and much more likely to approve transactions if they have had the opportunity to authenticate. So if you're choosing to send transactions to a issuer on EMV 3DS and they have not yet live, then there is a much higher likelihood that those transactions may be declined. So it's really important that you consider this when deciding what to do. But what you'll really find, uh, and I'm going to pass this back to Paul now because he can maybe explain this and, and what Cardinal do, because really, generally speaking, um, your vendor should be able to help you out with this and help you route those transactions in the most appropriate way for the best possible outcome. So, yeah, Paul, I don't know. I'm sure you've got some comments on this as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and certainly, a you know, I think if merchants um, partner with a reputable um, 3DS provider, then they're certainly going to be able to uh, provide that sort of um, what we call a cardinal protocol routing. Uh, so, in other words, we take the heavy lifting and uh, all the work and the worry out of the uh, hands and the minds of the, the customer. We will uh, route the transaction down the appropriate rails. Uh, depending on the issuer readiness. Um, so, again, I think that's uh, a point to, to stress, you know, if you're not using 3D Secure today, 
um, do start talking to um, 3DS providers, and I, it, it, it's, it's well worth investing time in uh, researching because there are many uh, 3DS providers uh, appearing out of the woodwork, and uh, it's important that you you partner with a company that has um, you know a lot of experience in the field and a good reputation, and they will then be able to. Uh, guide you in the right path and, and design a solution that's really tailored to your business uh, and to your business objectives. Um, so if you're an omni-channel uh, uh, business that's really just e evolving in, into the e-commerce environment, or maybe you're an app-based uh, um, uh, business, that's where uh, working with a, a, a good, strong 3DS provider will, uh, will really reap benefit. So that brings us to the end of the, uh, the 10 minutes, and that, that was it, 10 minutes. Um, so we've got a few minutes for um, some questions, uh, and I see that um, a few people have sent in some questions. So uh, there's a question here from Desmond. Uh, will there be issuers dropping the support for 3DS1 after they completed the implementation of EMV 3DS. Would either of you like to address that? Yeah, it's Caroline. I'll, I'll answer this one, Paul. Um, so yes, um, we have advised everybody for the time being during the transition period to maintain both versions. So um, once we have the transition fully completed, then yes, absolutely, we will see issuers dropping version one. But for the time being, we do expect there will be some merchants who are not ready, some merchants who are choosing for whatever reason to stay on version one. And so we're absolutely advising all issuers for the time being um, to stay on version one. Uh, what we will be doing, though, because we're often asked about sunsetting version one, is that we will be at some point in the future removing liability protection on version one. And we'll be publishing details of that in due course. But for the time being, there's no change. Okay. Um, another question from uh, Nita. Uh, you mentioned that merchant-initiated transactions must be flagged in a particular way. Can you elaborate or give an example? That's something um, uh, perhaps yes. Caroline you'd like to address? Yes. Well, I'm not going to detail because I think it, the detail of how you flag it differs uh, by every scheme. And also, what you have to think is when the schemes tell you it must be flagged a certain way, probably your acquirer is shielding you from that and he's saying, okay, flag it this way, and with that I have enough to translate it for whatever the speech scheme wants, okay? But I'll, I'll take one quick example. An MIP is out of scope only as long as authentication was performed when you set up the mandate for the MIT. So when the cardholder is there to say, I agree, you, you, you can charge me later, during that transaction, authentication must be done. Each transaction has, uh, in the authorization system has a transaction ID. And uh, each scheme requires that that transaction ID of when the MIT mandate was set up be present in the MIT. So you need to plan for that. You need to store the trend ID of a certain transaction and then populate it in future MITs. So if you've not heard there's a way to flag MITs, it is extremely urgent you speak with your acquirer and you do so ASAP. So when we talk about flagging MIPs, we flag, we're talking about in the authorization system, not uh, in the 3DS request. So very scheme specific, lots of things to consider for that. If you have not heard it's urgent you flag it ASAP, we recommend by the fall, um, or, I mean, sooner the better. Some countries are starting to uh, roll out soft decline policies, meaning they decline requiring SVA. Well, if they do that on something that is an MIT, because you haven't flagged it, so they don't know, well, in an MIT, you're not able to ask for authentication, so you'll lose the transaction. So if you want to avoid those situations, you need to get ready to flag MITs ASAP. Okay, thank you, Caroline. Um, 
Another question here from Makis. Uh, is it required to initiate a 3DS flow to request an exemption, or can this be done through authorization message as well? And will the risk um, of, with the, with the risk, of course, to receive a, a response code 65? Yeah, well, I'm not sure what's response code 65. That's probably an example of either another scheme or just the, the acquired yeah. response. But, but you probably mean though. I decline because I request SCA. Uh, I alluded to that a little bit earlier. Yes, uh, all exemptions can be used uh, direct to authorization. Uh, and uh, or, or and all except the low value. Low value can only be used in authorization, but all the others can also be used via 3DS. Okay, but there's different factors to consider which way is the best route. So that's why when I uh, talk about exemption, I said speak with your acquirers for the best way to handle it. They should be able uh, to advise because it's it, like I can advise what we as team advise, but then it depends what your acquirer decides to do. And they may say, in your case, your fraud's a bit high, we'll only support it if you go to 3DS first. So that's why you need to discuss that with your acquirer. Okay, uh, wonderful. Thank you, Caroline. And uh, I think we might have uh, time for one more question. Um, this is from uh, Beth Lee. Uh, do you have, well, first she said, hello, do you have any figures regarding increase in fraud during the COVID lockdown period? So I don't know if that's something that uh, Visa is able to publicly comment on. Um, yeah, I'll answer this one, Paul. I mean, it's a difficult question to answer, to be honest, because I think, mm -hmm. like anything, looking at figures across the board is not meaningful, really. You need to really look at specific circumstances. So specific industries always carry different risk profiles. And I think what's really important here is that issuers who have really good risk engines and also merchants, importantly, um, using um, risk assessment um, software and, and technology, it's really machine learning, really sophisticated systems that can adapt and learn to the conditions are, are just so important. Um, forces will always be on the lookout, whether it be COVID, whether it be anything else at all. Forces are always on the lookout for new tricks. And I think the most important thing that we're telling all of our um, issuers across Europe is just please use the best possible risk assessment, um, risk-based authentication tools that you can, because that way you're protected, you're able to make good risk decisions, you only challenge when it's absolutely necessary. Um, and obviously on the merchant side, it's exactly the same. And this is where 3D Secure comes in as a really, really valuable fraud for tool, because it really helps everybody avoid any of those hiccups. Uh, but clearly, yeah, there's all sorts of really interesting patterns in the current time, and I wouldn't really like to kind of quote anything off the top of my head, A, probably because it's not a very good idea to do so, and also because there are just too many different variables here. But, but I think it's a very interesting question, and certainly the importance of, of managing fraud is, has never been more important than it is now. So thank you for the question. Yeah, and uh, um, thank you for uh, uh, trying to address that. Um, okay, well, I think that uh, leaves us uh, for there. Um, I think there's a, an underlying theme here, though, isn't there, that merchants just need to um, make sure they take the time now to prepare. Even as we talk about uh, deadlines being potentially pushed out, um, there's nothing like, uh, you know, finding a, a, the right 3DS provider and then really working out a solution uh, that is designed for your particular business and then to be able to test it uh, and to make sure that when, um, when the day does uh, arrive, uh, when PSD2 and SCA comes into effect, that uh, you're ready. Um, so uh, I would really very much like to uh, thank uh, both Caroline and Caroline uh, for joining today and for dealing with the challenges, of course, of hosting a webinar from your respective homes. So thank you so much. Um, and uh, we, we hope that this information uh, might have clarified some topics in the minds of, of the audience. And uh, again, we do hope that you and your families uh, all remain safe. And we look forward to joining uh, you on our next webinar, um, the date of which will soon be announced. Uh, in the meantime, goodbye. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, everyone.
Thank you. It was a pleasure.